Over many months, 300 workers all joined the plan. They bribed the guards and walked out of the signal com compound in the middle of the night. Then, they called a press conference to make the, their statement right outside the signal company gates, with buses ready to whisk them away before the police arrived. When did the buses get here? They were supposed to arrive one hour back. No, no, they're coming now. I can't believe we just got out of signal and now we're going back there. But well, we're not going inside, we're just standing outside and doing the test conference. And then we're going to DC. Guys, the journalists are already arriving there. But why is everyone getting the time wrong? Is this daylight saving time bubble? What is this daylight saving time? Ah. Uh -huh. 
and deadlines, that's not really where my head was. And when I missed that deadline, I thought it would be about as bad a problem to have as an unreturned library. Um, but then 9-11 happened. And I joined a lot of undocumented people in Chicago who were in low-wage work. I was working in restaurants. Uh, I worked on a cruise ship for a little while on the river, on the, um, you know, the, the river that runs through the city. You know, I worked at a car wash. And I got introduced to all of this immigrant labor and all these immigrant workers who worked side by side with me and got introduced to community organizing. Um, I didn't get into labor organizing, though I didn't really learn organizing until I got to New Orleans. Um, and that's when I received the anonymous phone call from a man who led me um, to the story inside this book. I'm, I think I want to jump around a bit. I know not everyone uh, has, has had a chance to read the book, and there's always the uh, worry about quote unquote giving something away, uh, but there's like I said, this is a this is a book that just keeps on giving. No matter what, how much we give away, there there is going to be more. I'm thinking of how uh, a scene that you describe in the book of of seeing on the TV in Chicago uh, the pictures of people stranded on their rooftops after Hurricane Katrina. Often we hear that disasters um, you know, bring about the best in people, they want to help each other, the sense of solidarity and generosity, but they also bring about the worst in people, as we saw in those scenes. But it is those very scenes that actually propel you to go there and help. So I'm thinking about this tension between um, disaster capitalism and disaster collectivism. Uh, which is something that you talked a, a, about a lot. If collectivism is, uh, I mean, disaster preparedness is a form of collectivism, then collectivism could also be a form of disaster prevention. Um, so I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how this has played out um, through your work in Resilience Force, which we haven't even talked about, and I was so immersed in the great escape that I didn't mention at the beginning, so I'll take a minute to mention that um, Saki Tsongi also is the founder and director of Resilience Force, which is a labor organization for the workers who are rebuilding after disasters, including climate disasters, which are all around the world. Climate disasters go around the world, migrant labor follows those disasters, and Resilience Force follows those workers. And there's a scene in the book where you describe every morning at five in the morning, uh, going to uh, the 60-foot statue of Robert E. Lee in New Orleans, where every morning the workers come to receive their job for the day. It's daily wage work. They come there to get their assignments. They get on buses. And then uh, we have this image of you catching those buses and following those workers, giving them your card, giving them pamphlets, letting them know their rights, so that in this process, they don't get exploited the way that we saw uh, in, in this book. So um, Resilience Force is now acting like a collective voice for these workers who are actually increasing in number around the world. As disasters increase, migration increases, uh, migrant labor has just become a, a convenient way to A, avoid paying minimum wages or living wages, and B, avoid um, recognizing the true cost of disaster. So this is where I am wondering, instead of just cleaning up after disasters, do you see a potential of your work in Resilience Force to make, the, make policies and corporations take into account the full cost of the disaster if you were really to pay living wages where people you were dependent on migrant labor and, and, and all of that? And, and could that complete the circle to the point of preventing the disaster? Yeah, um, that's a lot of the work we're doing now. You know, the workers in the book were um, immigrant workers brought to the U.S. to rebuild after Hurricane Katrina. Um, they were lied to. Um, they were told they would get green cards. They weren't any green cards. They paid $20,000, and it turned out they were brought into a situation where instead of an American dream, they were dropped into a nightmare where they were living in labor camps on company property behind a barbed wire fence, working 12-hour shifts round the clock. So the company got a 24-hour uh, round-the-clock workforce 
of some of the best workers in the world for a third of the price of um, U.S. labor. Right? So that was the, the scheme there. What I didn't know at the time was that these were among the first workers that would be brought again and again um, to successive disasters. After Hurricane Katrina, because of climate change, there have been more floods and fires. Um, many of you live in Houston um, or in North Carolina uh, or, or in the Bay Area and, and parts of Northern California. And I'm sure that, that all of you who are homeowners um, are worried about your insurance. And that's all because of um, the prospect of disaster, right? Um, disaster is now part of our lives, and that means recovery and repair um, is a big part of what you have to plan for. The way that work happens is that it's largely carried out, uh, if not entirely, by immigrant workers, uh, mostly undocumented immigrant workers who go from disaster to disaster to help repair. So the work that Resilience Force does is as workers follow disasters, we follow workers. Um, I watch these workers become the, blood, the, the white blood cells of American society, um, repairing year after year. Sometimes workers would work six, seven, eight disasters a year. Um, four floods, three storms, two fires. They crisscross across the country. And, um, and so we formed an organization called Resilience Force to be their voice, uh, to be their representatives. And now, um, as government is catching up, people are realizing you can't just wait till the disaster to repair. You have to make homes strong before the disaster. Um, you know, in, in Louisiana, for example, um, you have money being given to homeowners to swap out old roofs for metal roofs. In California, a lot of flammable, um, uh, invasive flammable um, vegetation has to be removed, right? So that embers don't fly from um, vegetation onto your rooftop. A, a small thing like that, and your house can burst into flames. But all that preventive work is labor. All of it has to be done by somebody. It can't be automated. It has to be done by human beings. And most of the people doing that work um, are immigrant workers largely undocumented. So we're creating this system where people will work year-round at high wages with good safety conditions to do all of this work, all of this resilience work. Well, I don't want to ask all the questions, so I do have many. I just want to let everyone know that you'll also have a chance to ask questions. So uh, maybe I'll just ask two more <laughs> before uh, opening it up. I have always been thinking about what you were saying about immigrants, uh, about the resilience force being the white blood cells. Um, because again, they're often uh, undocumented. Um, you described the life of a migrant as one in which you leave the ones you love to help them live. The uh, notion of being able to afford to live with your family in the place where you are able to get a job um, is, is, a, is a dilemma, is a conundrum, not only faced by immigrants, but uh, I, just the other day I was listening uh, uh, to a story about firefighters on NPR, and it's being faced domestically also, that you have to migrate for a job and you, you can't afford to live there other than in, in, right. in this kind of a situation. So when we talk about this resilience force being uh, America's white blood cells, that my question is about the body that those white blood cells are protecting. Whose body is it? Well, um, you know, the, um, well, two things. One is that the workers we work with are mostly, um, as they're working, they're mostly itinerant. So, for example, uh, you know, a few weeks, a few days ago, actually, a week and a half ago, uh, there was uh, there were uh, uh, wind storms through Houston. Um, and how many of you live in Houston? Um, and I hope your homes were okay, uh, but you were probably very worried. Um, you know, these were massive storms, and when these winds hit land, there were all these spin-off tornadoes that came through. 
um, and huge trees snapped like toothpicks and landed on roofs, right? Um, when tornadoes fly through neighborhoods, one home can be left intact. The home next to it can be flattened, right? And so what that means is that um, homeowners and families who live in those homes need repairs to be done immediately. If there's a hole in your roof or a tree has fallen through, the next rain could destroy so much of your property, right? Um, so my members, the resilience workers, are the ones who drive in, and they live in their cars usually. Um, they sleep on the floor of the parking lot, um, usually outside of Walmart or Home Depot. And every morning they gather by the hundreds, and contractors come and pick them up, and they'll be the ones who bring them to your home. So um, you know, after you call the insurance company and you get the sign off, you need a crew of ten people or 20. Um, my members are the crew that comes in. Uh, when we, we're right up, you know, we're right behind them. And, um, and so, you know, at a fundamental level, we're protecting families and homes. But at another level, the other uh, beautiful thing that happens is that each of these occurrences of work is a wonderful way to build a relationship with a stranger, you know, because there's so much gratitude and so much of a sense of vulnerability after a disaster. Um, and so we come in with interpreters and we come in with, um, you know, with organizers and we help homeowners build relationships with workers. A lot of the times these homeowners um, are, um, you know, they, they look very different from this room. Right? In Florida and Texas, a lot of these homeowners are white Trump supporters who before the disaster thought of immigrants as the enemy and now are relying on immigrants to come back home. So we take that opening to change their minds. We come in and we um, interpret for them and we uh, you know, create dinners so that people can, very much in the spirit of your organization, we're coming in not just to get physical rebuilding done, but to rebuild society after disasters. Um, so that's, that's the work you know, that we do now. I didn't know that's the work that all would get started when I got the phone call at the beginning of the book. Um, at the beginning of the book, it's just an anonymous, uh, an, anonymous, uh, an anonymous man, a man who's too scared to give his name, um, or even to tell me who he is, or what company he's working for, but just someone who seems like he's in a lot of trouble. Um, and you know, I went on the hunt for this gentleman, and the two others who called me and um, stumbled into what wound up becoming one of the largest human trafficking um, schemes in modern US history. Um, and, and those workers, you know, they were, um, they are the subjects of the book, but they were only a small sliver of the workers that I was helping after Hurricane Katrina. Katrina wound up becoming the first real climate disaster on people's consciousness in a big way. And it still, you know, it still um, represents a kind of turning point in history where the, the, the dawn of a new era, climate change would really shape and mark the way all of us live. Um, and, and now disasters are with us every day, but as a result, so are these immigrants, you know. Yeah, so you say that the, the, the people you describe in the book, and there are a handful who we get to know in much greater depth, uh, out of all the 500. Um, I, I was just thinking, you know, who is your target audience for the book? Because I've heard you talk about how you really wanted the world to know the people the way you knew them. So why? Why did you want the world to know? And who are you hoping reads this book? Well, honestly, um, as I was writing it, um, I wrote this book for a very, very specific set of people. Um, one of the characters in the book is a man named Ebi Raju. Um, Ebi is the, you know, one of the four or five central characters. Um, the problem, the challenge of writing a book like this is that you've got 500 workers. And you can't really write about 500 people um, because books do really specific things. You know, um, a, a film, you can show 500 people. But in a book, 
what a book can do like that nothing else can do is it allows you to go into the interiority, the thoughts, the, the desires, the wishes uh, of individuals. You know, so I had to pick four people or five. That was really hard. Um, so I chose a couple of people and uh, one of them is Evi Raju. He was a motorcycle riding 20-something year old uh, from Kerala who had just come back from a job in Bahrain. He had spent five years in Bahrain, come back and, and hadn't been home in five years. And he found that his parents were older and they were poorer than when he left. You know, India was spiral. Um, and he couldn't afford his father a retirement. His father who had retired had gone back to a job uh, delivering the Manorba Daily News, the local paper, in a truck, you know, and at, at his age, getting on and off a truck, delivering this paper, and Abby was just overwhelmed with a sense of shame and duty, and needed to get back out there, didn't have time to waste, but he needed to go to a place where um, the Indian currency value of his earnings were higher than in Bahrain. Um, that was his motivation, you know. Hemant Kutan was uh, a kid from Delhi. I could have been Hemant Kutan. He was the son of a police officer. And uh, he had fallen in love with his high school sweetheart, uh, but her father was several stations above uh, being a police officer. You know, so he visited um, his, his uh, beloved Shruti's father, and uh, the father said, go make something of yourself. Kuch baro. Right? Go make something of yourself and we'll see if this marriage can happen. Hamath wanted this love marriage and so he came to the United States, he answered the ad um, for love, you know. And those were the motivations of the people who came. Um, it was, you know, it, it was not so much that people were sitting in India thinking about the American dream. It was people sitting in India trying to solve a very practical problem with their, in their lives, right? And that practical problem was the one you said, it, you, you described, which is, as, as Emmy said to me, what is it to be a migrant worker? It's basically leaving people you love to help them live, right? He had to leave his parents, leave his new wife, to help supply them a livelihood, right? Um, so, so they came, and as I got to know them, they grew, we grew up together, we all met in our late 20s, early 30s, 10 years later. Um, they were secure, they were citizens. Um, you know, they, it, I, I don't think I'm giving it away to say that the book ends well. It's a rare book about immigrants that has a happy end, you know. Um, but then I started noticing their children growing up, you know, and uh, Evi and Hemant um, and others, Shokat Ali Sheikh, who's the uh, central Muslim character in the book. I'd sit with them in their homes, and their children would ask them about their journeys. And these, uh, these men would leave so much out, you know, because they didn't want their children, in some cases, to know about the pain. Uh, they didn't want them to know what they had suffered through. Um, sometimes hilariously so. For example, when I finally wrote the book, uh, Shaukat Ali Sheikh told me that he would let his daughters read it when they were past the age of 25. And I said, Shaka, you'll never be able to control what your daughter's doing. <laughs> um, but, you know, he, he, he had this. So I really started writing this book specifically for the children of these workers because I, I thought it would be part of healing from suffering to be able to have this profound act of storytelling. You know, and um, every child deserves to know what their parents went through for them. You know, I, the fact that I know what my parents went through for me changed my life. You know, um, every child deserves to know that. But every parent wants to shield their children. And so I would be in these processes with these families um, trying to um, turn so much trauma into a book. And initially, some people were hesitant, but then as we did these interviews, the children would sit around the table, you know, listening to these interviews, and they would be fascinated by it. Um, one of the workers told me that 
the real service of the book was that his kids now cared about him. You know, that his kids now admired him. He was never an admired figure. You know, these are humble people. They're welders and pipe fitters. You know, they don't have jobs that they come and talk about at home. Um, jobs in government or or jobs in, in you know in, in, in some glamorous place. They come home tired and and hungry, and they play with their kids and they eat and they sleep and they go back to work. Um, but I, I wrote the book because I thought their love stories, their personal journeys, their extraordinary courage, um, it all should be experienced by these children. And so now we have this little reading group. You know, between the families, and so I, I don't know. I think that sometimes books that, um, at least in this case, I think that it kept me very honest to be writing for that audience. Um, I didn't really write it for the American public. I wrote it for about 25 people I know. You know, it was a love letter to them, um, and um, and it's. I think if you succeed at that, then usually other people will be interested in it as well. You know. Yeah, I think you succeeded amazingly. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'll tell you that so there's a member of my family who doesn't um, actually uh, enjoy reading nonfiction. Um, <laughs> 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 in one oh, sitting. Wow. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> day up until like wee hours of the morning. Oh, that's incredible. To finish this book. Um, I'd like to give others a chance. Um, yes, yeah, Sonika. Like, I, I would like to admit we are still pretty early on. We are actually listening to the book on Audible as a family. Oh, so thank you. Heard That's it so right wonderful. Here, and we're about 20% of the way through. Oh. I just want to echo everything that Arvinda said at the beginning. Didn't expect this. Um, in fact, at the point where you entered in the book, my daughter was like, is this a real story? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. And the way you sort of grab the reader by the throat with, you know, every random story. You just draw people in to the lives of people. Oh, thank you. And thank that's you. that's amazing for uh, for nonfiction, but just you know, it's just it, it, it's an amazing experience. I would like people who haven't read it or listened to it, download it on your Audible or whatever. And or from the library. Or take a copy here, right? Work. Yes, we have copies here. So yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's just. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, and maybe since I've taken the mic, I'll ask a question. I mean, there's a lot of reference to kids. You wrote it. I think, you know, you said you wrote it for these 25 people. I think more people should read it. It's it's just beautiful writing. You know, one of the things that you mentioned that um, uh, stuck to me was that the work that you do one on one with some of the families, right? Uh, an initial question in my mind was, do you do work to on sort of immigration issues, like right, at the policy level, your organization? But then when you talk about sort of the actual relationship building that you do, in some ways that work is even more important, right? You change hearts and minds, you know, you change people's attitudes towards immigrants and so forth. Is there a way in your organization that you can think of, you know, involving some of the youngsters? I think the other the other reason for writing the book is that was that if you look at the way immigrants are talked about in the United States, mm -hmm. um, they are always either people with a problem mm -hmm. or they are the problem, mm -hmm. and there's nothing in between. Mm -hmm. right? What they aren't is real people, mm -hmm. just people. They're not a problem, and they're not the problem. Right? They they are just real people with complicated lives. Uh, we are real people with complicated lives, right? We, we fight with our kids or our parents uh, or with our spouses. We fall in love. We struggle with money. We make very good decisions and very poor choices. And it's all a complex, wonderful human life, you know? So um, part of the idea of writing the book was writing in such a way that you could fall in love with people on the page that at the end of reading Eddie Rajan's story, or uh, Hemant's story, that you get to know them almost as well as you might know your best friend. You know? Or maybe better, because um, part of my contract uh, with Eddie and Hemant was that I wouldn't be turning them into heroes. You know? um, that if they were going to be in the book, they'd have to be very flawed, admirable to be sure, but really flawed, 
Um, there are workers in the book who start out as my friends, but don't remain my friends. There are people who criticize me, um, and I had to come across as very flawed. You know, um, I'm uh, at the beginning of the book, a 20-something year old, 29 year old, um, who is living in New Orleans. You know, uh, I'm estranged from my parents. I haven't called home in months. Um, the book starts on my birthday, and my mother calls me on my birthday, but I'm in a car stacking a stakeout situation, rescuing somebody from kidnapping, and I send my mother to voicemail, you know. Um, so the rule of a good book is that um, usually if you uh, have great people and great situations and just write about them, that's wonderful, but the book is not going to be very good, you know. In order to write a good book, you have to have flawed people who grow. That's what we enjoy watching. Um, who have to have conflict and tension. And, and I think that immigration is usually not covered that way. It, 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 it's all a world of saints and sinners. You know, and it's all a world of people who have problems and, or people who are the problem. And so what I hope is that, particularly in immigrant families, that the children we raise and the children we, we know grow up willing to entertain a far more complex reality than, than our generation, you know, where we only deal with immigration in very simple terms around elections, and then never again until the next elections. You know, on the question of, um, on what you said, Sonika, about visas, you know, whether you came in on a short-term visa and lived in you know, a small hotel room or a labor camp, or when you came in, um, you know, long term, there is something just to the core of your dignity that is hurt by the idea that people who want your work don't want you to stay. And that's just a very profound thing. Um, there was a, um, a Swiss reporter who, uh, in the 60s, who was writing about Europe and Europe's acceptance or lack of acceptance of immigrants at the time. And he said something very profound. He said it from the point of view of, you know, Swiss or European um, politician. He said, um, we wanted workers, but we got human beings instead. We just wanted their work, but then they came with all their humanity and their problems, and that was never the deal, right? And that's what a lot of people experience, whether, they're, whether they come to teach at a university or to staff the Medicaid program or, uh, or uh, you know, come to the high tech sector. And that produces pain. And, um, you know, I, I, I want, you know, I, I think that every immigrant family needs to make it a project to help their, to help tell these stories in a way that that pain turns into an ethos, a way of living, and a way of accepting other people. So I think that's more important than policy. And uh, if this book can contribute a little towards that, that's what I would want young people to take away from it. Thank you. I think, um, Rashim, we have a high-tech method of collecting questions. So <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Thank Amazing. you who have wow. put the questions on the pigeonhole. And I'm going to be brief because I don't have the background who is writing Do the question. Do you want to read, like, maybe two, three questions? So two yeah. questions uh, which are reported. Uh, one is personal for Sakri. Can you take the mic? Yeah. <laughs> I do? <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, so the question is, uh, did you write stories as a child or in school? That's one question. And the second question is, is the situation of migrant landless laborers in India similar to the undocumented immigrant workers in the US? Uh -huh. uh, well, my, uh, I, I did write as a child. I, um, my school in Delhi was very atypical. Um, it was, um, how many of you are from Delhi? Anyone? Uh, so this was a, a, you know, by Delhi standards, a small school. Um, it was what we call there a public school, which means private school. Um, 
it wasn't, you know, the elite schools. It, it wasn't, you know, my, my dad was a civil servant and not a high-ranking civil servant, you know, so this was a middle, you know, school full of middle class people, but the, um, but the principal of the school was a, 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 an activist and a very profound educator. And so she would turn the entire student body of the school into uh, her turnout factory for whatever cause she wanted to join. <laughs> we were a active audience, you know. So uh, when I was young, I would um, basically, you know, drop a hat. Like, I mean, and it was great, right? What student, especially in Delhi, doesn't want to skip class, right? So it was a win-win, you know. Um, and I wonder, you know, my parents, they, they were fine with it. I wonder though, some of those parents of my friends who went back and said, you know, when, when parents would ask, you know, uh, what they did at school that day. Because, so, so for example, um, at some point, um, the school started turning us out, thousands of kids, uh, to rallies demanding the freedom of Nelson Mandela. At other times, it was rallies for, you know, um, uh, some kind of trade union strike or something. Um, Saftar Hashmi, the famous playwright, was a big friend in school. And in fact, his wife would come in and teach theater. So this was a very politically committed, conscious school, trying to create these little citizens who, you know, had a, had a certain recognition of justice and injustice. And in that context, I became sort of the de facto school playwright. And uh, at some point, for example, I wrote a play about um, a highly fictional play, uh, I would say, about the possibility of great friendship between India and China. <laughs> um, so, so those were the, the, the kinds, of, uh, you know, kinds of things I was doing in school. Um, you know, I, I, I think that, that that's part of why I was so, my heart was so gladdened by what these, uh, the, the young actors did here. I really think theater is a great way for young people, or for anyone really, uh, to tap into the kind of courageous and playful part of themselves. Because you don't have to change who you are, you just have to step into someone else's situation, right? Just for a minute, or a day, or a week. And I, and I think if I hadn't, done all that, I probably wouldn't have found my way to becoming an organizer because that's a, it's a very profoundly empathetic exercise to step in and play someone else. Um, you know, on the second question of landless laborers, um, you know, so the undocumented in the United States are, I think, a very particular type of class of people, um, and particularly recently. Because so much of U.S. politics um, swirls around the question of what to do with the undocumented and what to do with the border, um, and I, I don't think that that is the driving political issue um, in India. Um, I think it's you know we all know in this room though that um, otherness and um, uh, you know and minority status and outsiderhood, um, you know, are all being uh, demagogued in India for political gain. I mean, that's just unfortunately where, um, where the public conversation is in India. Um, suddenly, you know, uh, even being a journalist is, is being a class that, that is a threat and therefore, you know, must be disciplined. So I, I don't think there's an exact parallel, but in the book there is a, a character named Shaukat Ali Khan, who I talked about. He's a very fascinating man. He was a landless laborer in Bihar. And in learning his story and understanding his story fully, I, it really, really struck me how little I knew. I mean, having grown up in India, but growing up in Delhi, you know, how, <coughs> And I read, and I read a lot, you know, I was very informed, but until he gave me, for days and days, sat, out, sat down with me and described how he grew up 
and, and how his family, a Muslim family, a landless Muslim family in Bihar, how they grew up. You know, I didn't quite fully grasp what a feudal society, his, um, you know, his, his uh, immediate surroundings were. Um, one little story about Shokat, though, uh, that I want to tell you, and I think you all will appreciate it, is uh, when the book finally came out, he called, and I just got very excited because, you know, I got ready to accept his congratulations, <laughs> you know, and he said, Sakaji, you know, um, I I've got great news, and I said, I know, I know, it's great news, the book is out, we're in the New York Times, he said, no, no, don't worry about that. It's not what I thought about. I said, okay. He said, look, I want to tell you I won my campaign. I finally won my campaign. And, and I said, well, what do you mean? I mean, we won your campaign years ago. You're a citizen. You're, you're, you're all good. He said, no, no, no. My campaign never stopped. I, I finally won my campaign. And I said, okay, what do you mean? He said, my daughter just got into five medical schools. <laughs> now my campaign is complete. <laughs> you know, and, and it occurred to me that um, for, for me, the book was a book, you know, it had a beginning and an end, right? But really that's so artificial. For Shaka, his story started generations or lifetimes before his birth. And it's going on, you know, and even after he dies, his daughter and his grandchildren will carry on. And, and, and it's just one continuous story. Um, which is actually a much more exciting story than a book can ever tell. Unfortunately, a book has to open and close. But, you know, Shokan's life doesn't. And I thought that was really incredible. Joe, Joe! Joe! Okay, Joe, and then you tell um, me. Yeah. yeah, I, I also love the book. I uh, we're about 70% true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, uh, Hearing you talk about these generations, I'm also just thinking about how you have so much sympathy for kind of the, the uh, villains also, <laughs> and like the ice agent whose family history goes back to these hunters, and, mm -hmm. and the uh, Indian ambassador who wanted to get a nuclear deal and, and such. Um, and I was kind of curious if there's a, a piece of art or religious story that's kind of provided their moral compass for navigating these situations and writing this book and humanizing everyone, but also showing everyone's flaws. Thank you. Yeah, it was very interesting. So when I met these workers, you know, these are, they're welders and pipe fitters in India. The furthest they've ever gone is to Dubai and Bahrain, right? Um, they are not the kinds of people who up until that point had been prioritized for immigration into the United States, right? Because the United States has a selective immigration policy that picks and chooses what professions or what people they want to have enter, right? I mean, that's, I mean, that's what shapes American immigration, right? Um, and these people were never part of that, right? Welders and pipe fitters and other working class people the people who we call, which I don't agree with the word, but who we call unskilled, um, you know, uh, the doors to the United States had been shut to them for a long time. Um, when they arrived in the US, um, you know, there were a lot of theories about who could help them. Uh, a lot of these workers had, of course, they were mistreated by the company, right? Um, and we didn't know at the beginning about the ICE agent's role in it. But when we engineered the Great Escape, and when we got 500 workers out from the labor camps in Mississippi and Texas, and then went to New Orleans and, and called the Department of Justice, the workers really believed in U.S. institutions. They had a profound faith in U.S. institutions. Sorry? Sorry. Um, no worries. Um, yeah, they had faith in U.S. institutions, and they thought it would be easy. Um, when we went to meet with the Indian ambassador, they were really very worried about, what they were very worried about was that, that their presence in the United States 
would make elite Indians look bad. And that elite Indians would not want anything other than their return to India. You know, so they were very worried about Indian politicians, representatives of the nation of India, and they were also very worried about, um, you know, uh, the kind of Indians that have succeeded in the U.S. that we hear about in India. You know, so that was one one anxiety, one point of anxiety. Um, another point of anxiety was. Um, they, they were very worried about um, basically they were worried that uh, they had to play the role of the poor Indian. As in, you know, India is a complex country. I mean, sure, these are welders and pipefitters, but many of them have pensions. Many of them have homes. And they were very concerned that if American decision makers learned that they weren't so poor as to be destitute, and they did have homes, some of whom you know, owned, owned their homes, so th there was this pressure on them to be the perfect victim, you know, and um, and in that sense, they were going off the knowledge that they had, you know, uh, they felt that. India and the and the ambassador and others, the kind of um, the the representatives of India would never want them to stay in the United States. Elite Indians would worry about standing next to them, um, and the only way to pull at the heartstrings of the United States to to American decision makers, and by American they meant white people, you know, um, was to to just sort of tell the victim story, right? It was a struggle to get them to. To see a little bit more of an expansive reality, you know, there were elite Indians who helped, right? That there were uh, lawmakers who understood that the point was not that they were poor and destitute. The point was that they were trafficked. So we had to kind of tell a more complex story of these workers. One interesting debate, for example, was that a lot of um, a lot of people who worked for years on human trafficking issues told us that we should not have these people protesting. And they said that it was because people who protest look too empowered. <laughs> right, right? So we said, well, too empowered. I mean, these people were literally trafficked and held in forced labor. And they're upset. <laughs> I mean, protest is the language of people who are upset, right? And don't have access to power. So. We, we have to kind of complicate people's view. And I say all this just as the wind up to say that um, I followed that thread to complicate my view of the ice agents and the so called bad guys in the book. I mean, obviously, when I was campaigning, I was against them, right? Um, and there wasn't space in a campaign to take a far more complex view. But what ended up happening was that in the writing, I got very, very deeply uh, re-anchored in all the losses that these men and their families faced. And I really wanted to hold someone accountable. And my mind got fixed on this ICE agent, who we didn't know about at the beginning of the story. When the workers started marching, as you saw the young people, young actors perform, when we started marching from New Orleans to Washington, what we didn't know at the time was that Inside the U.S. government, deep inside the U.S. government, there was uh, there were law enforcement officials with their own corrupt ties to the company. I learned the full extent of that during the research and writing of the book, and I was so angry that I wanted to find this ICE agent at the center of this, largely to hold him accountable. I wanted to create the day, the judgment day for him, that had never come to him. He was sitting peacefully, retired, fishing in Mississippi, you know, having a barbecue, and I was dealing with all these broken lives. So I went there to reckon with him. But what I found when I found him, and I, it took a long time to find him, there were lots of Alvin Ladners, and you know, I found a 900 page family history in a Bay St. Louis library, and I used that to find him all, every Ladner I could find, and finally got him, you know, and there he was, and he agreed to meet with me. And when I went there, Instead of finding a monster, I found a human being. And 
I realized that I had to give him the same kind of complex treatment. You know, he wasn't a villain. He was a human being at a time and a place with certain incentives and pressures on him and came from a history. And, um, and over six hours, we, the only way we could talk was that we had to, we had to recognize that we were human beings, that we, you know, we were real people. Um, in terms of a religious or artistic, um, you know, um, compass point, I, um, I grew up pretty secular. I'm very secular. I, 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 um, you know, I, I'm very deeply connected to very spiritual people, and and I believe in you know in, in a moral basis for life, of course. Uh, but there's not a religious driver. I think, if anything, I think great literature and great writers were sort of my tutors. Um, if you read, uh, you know, I, I read, for example, um, one of the most astonishing. Um, reading, uh, uh, sort of uh, instructive readings for me was uh, the short stories of Jhumpa Nair. You know, it's a very different kind of immigrant. You know, these are people who come from some of the more elite parts of India in terms of family background. They come into, you know, elite confines of American life like Harvard University. And yet, you know, um, she writes about pain in such exact terms and about emotions in such precise terms. And I thought if I could ever write about Evie Raju, the way she writes about you know, the father in one of the stories, um, that would be an incredible accomplishment. You know, so I just wanted to kind of learn, uh, learn from good writers. Um, and, and one interesting thing when good writers write characters is um, you, you continue to wonder where that character will end up. You know, you don't know at the outset, and that was the rule I tried to apply um, to the book. So thank you for reading. Uh, I'm excited to, to uh, did you finish it? Almost. Almost, okay. <laughs> excited to see what you think at the end. Yeah. So, I, I know the is kind of looking at me, um, but until she stops me, I can <laughs> Speak good. Um, do you want to uh, ask a question? And I just want everyone to see a copy of the book, which you all uh, get. There you go, we'll give us the instructions uh, of how to do that. And after lunch, you'll also have a chance to have it signed. Mr. go ahead. Um, your story and the book is outside in the US, uh, but the ingredients, the Japan disaster, the workforce and immigrant story, and the xenophobic attitudes, they're prevalent everywhere around the world, even in India. Uh, so how do you, where do you see this movement and this transition where people are moving across borders, uh, working in an economy that's you know, driven by this? Where do you see this going forward? You know, the good force of the acceptance and you know, right? Well, you know, um, an easy analogy is that um, you know we all know that our homes are not ready for climate change, right? We we just know that. Um, you know, that's why your insurance is going up, right? That's why um, your uh, your work. If you if you live anywhere near a body of water or a or a, or a you know, large tract of of land with vegetation, a park or a forest, that used to be the most wonderful thing. Now you stay awake at night worrying about it, at least for six months out of the year. It's because our homes aren't ready, and that's because our homes are outdated. You know, uh, they need to be retrofitted. They need to be prepared. I think it's a lot, a lot of that is also true for public policy. Our policy is just not ready for the kind of migration that will happen as a result of climate change. Um, and unfortunately, we're living at a time when, um, you know, uh, authoritarian uh, figures in politics are really finding a lot of profit in the idea of campaigning around harder borders, harder boundaries, um, and keeping people out um, at a time when there are just going to be millions of people on the move trying to get in. You know, and we, we could use that as an asset. We could use the movement and, and the fluidity of the world um, as an asset. 
but we don't. We, we, we use it as a political, you know, some, some people use it as political fodder. Um, I, I think that our hope to change that is through participation. You know, that's why I really admire the work of A. Um, I've spent years and years, I, I, you know, uh, talking to Indian Americans. Um, and almost to a T, you know, for so many people who immigrate, um, and this is not just confined to Indian Americans, I mean, you know this very well, you know, but the, the, the rule is the first generation of immigrants shouldn't get involved in politics, right? The, the, the uh, um, priority should be keeping your head down, working, staying out of trouble, and uh, assimilating. Right? And I've been there. I mean, as a foreign student, I came to the University of Chicago, and I was really nervous about joining protests and putting my name on things because my foreign visa was back in the blink of an eye, you know. And I had to be really smart about, you know, my long term. That's how a lot of immigrants feel. But but I think that unless immigrants themselves tell their stories and unless we raise our voices, very little will change. And, and some of the key is in building relationships across immigrant and non-immigrant uh, community members. You know, when immigrants and non-immigrants get together, then you mobilize voters, you change attitudes. Um, you know, the undocumented have people in their families who are voters, right? Who are not undocumented. Um, most families are mixed, right? Uh, most South Asian immigrants who have status, no people without status, right? Um, those of us with more of a pathway need to speak on behalf of those who don't have a pathway. I, I, I think that that kind of work, you know, it, as long as it's happening, it's never too small to make a difference. And I think that's what we all have to do. You know, a lot of people ask, uh, what can I do as an individual? Because the world is so bad and the problems are so big. The answer to that is just stop being an individual. And that's what you all have done. You join something. You know, people just need to join things. All right, I will request Dave to come and uh, do the dirty work. The <laughs> 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 so, Rashid says there are a lot more questions, however, on the pigeonhole, and I know that you know you'll probably have a crowd sitting with you at lunch. But is it at all possible that I could share some of these questions with you Absolutely. by email Absolutely. and then Please. I can share them back? That would be wonderful. And I just want to say thank you so much for having me here. What a joy. I, um, I was so heartbroken that I couldn't join your conference in the Bay Area last year. Uh, Arvinda invited me and it just didn't work out. Um, but I'm so glad this was here. I'm so glad it was, you know, um, it, it was here in North Carolina because the book actually stops in Greensboro, right. so it made it even more perfect. There's a Greensboro chapter uh, in the book, um, and you I actually was contacted the beloved community. Oh, that's wonderful! And they were thinking of having Reverend Johnson also oh, attend, but it didn't work God. out. That was going to be another surprise. So <laughs> oh, that would have been so great. Well, um, and you know, there I was in Washington at a book event, um, and uh, all of a sudden. Uh, right after it was Arvinda, so I just want to uh, say thank you for being so persistent <laughs> and recruiting me to come. Uh, how wonderful, and just so, so wonderful. And congratulations on the work you're doing. I, I couldn't be more proud uh, of just, I you know, sat in the back and watched your proceedings. Um, I run a nonprofit, I know how tough it is, but I also know that nothing replaces the active participation of the people who make up the DNA. You know, no one donor is going to come and give you the money and just do your work for you. It's, it's us, you know, we, we're the ones who want this to live. Uh, ultimately, um, you're the ones who are keeping this alive. So thank you for everything that you do um, every day, especially in the world we live in, where there are people, people, probably people who are not convinced, and yet you keep, you keep doing it. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
so much for this awesome conversation. Um, yeah, I'm Joe's wife, and we've reached about 70%, Joe! <laughs> 70 of the book, and we're happy to finish it. Um, where we get the <laughs> uh, where we can get the book. So what we're going to do is head to lunch, and then we're going to Heron's Roost, which is where book signing will happen. Part of this book was the feeling of victory. It oh, was the feeling of victory. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. That's true.